Aaron at Power Popaholic, and I am talking to Les Boehm and David Kendrick from the band Gleaming Spires, as well as a few other bands that they were in. They played in Sparks, and I know David uh, was in Devo for a short time. So uh, you, the reason, one of the reasons I'm talking to you is because you were in a few bands that was turned on to me by my friend Carrie, who basically said, hey, this band from the 80s, you know, came out with these new re-released records of, under the name Gleaming Spires. And I'm like, I've never heard of them. <laughs> and, and then they said, he said, oh yeah, yeah. They, they, they had a hit back then in the, in the eighties with the, are you ready for the sex girls that was on the revenge for the nerds soundtrack. I said, okay, great. So I started listening to the music and I was like, yeah, this, this really fits. And uh, especially uh, the first album I heard uh, songs like uh, when love goes under glass. And I said, wow, it's really easy to see why Sparks picked you guys to join them in 1981 uh, with Womp That Sucker, because it, it sounds like a perfect match. Um, but let me, let me let you tell me how you ended up, uh, because it seems like there was sort of a little bit of overlap between the Sparks period and when you were doing Gleaming Spires. So maybe you can tell me a little bit about that history. David, you want to start? Yeah, uh, sure. I actually um, the group that Les and I were both in at the time was Bates Motel, and Bates Motel was kind of a guitar, bass, drums, uh, four-piece band. And Sparks were coming out of a period of doing uh, heavy synthesizer stuff with Giorgio Moroder, and frankly, they kind of had it with that, and they wanted a rock band again. And we would run into them, see them in the uh, a cafe in Hollywood, California called the Farmer's Market. And we just hung out there every day and got, got to know them talking about movies and things. And we asked them to come see Bates Motel because we were playing live a lot um, with the thought maybe they would produce us or something. And lo and behold, they really liked the band as a band and asked us to be the Sparks Band again. And within weeks, we were in Munich making a record with them. So that was kind of the end of Bates Motel. And <laughs> one farewell gig in Munich, and that was it. Kind of being, yeah. <laughs> so and where the Gleaming Spires Gleaming... started after? Oh, so yeah. when? So when did Gleaming Spires exactly come into play? When did they? Start? Well, in the in in the days right before uh, Ron Russell asked us to join Sparks, David and I, David had joined Bates Motel. And we had started writing together. And so even as we were playing in Sparks, it was obvious to us that, that we had an affinity for, for each other's stuff. And so I, I, I don't really know when we started, you know, we, we, there were some songs I already had, there were some lyrics that David already had, and we started putting it all together. It was sort of interspersed with Sparks recording and Sparks gigs at first. As, I guess as, I mean, Ron Russell wrote the liner notes for the first album, so I, I we were clearly writing it in between the first two Sparks albums. Okay, all right. So, what was it like working for Ron and Russell? And uh, you know, how was that? Because you were there, I guess, for three albums. Am I right? So you were there for Womp That Sucker, and then Angst in My Pants, and then uh, Outer Space, where which is probably the closest they got to like commercial success with Cool Places, uh, that was probably their biggest commercial hit that, so if you play that, people will recognize, oh really? Oh yeah, I've heard that song. Um, whereas the other stuff that the fans all love, most people, not, they're still discovering it now, you know, yeah. 20, 30, 40 years later. Um, so, but what was it like working with them? Well, for, I liked Sparks before I was in the band. I mean, I, I, uh, I liked their music, so I was very enamored of, being asked to play when they again as i said they wanted to have a group again and we literally learned the songs from scratch in our rehearsal place um they weren't saying you know play this part that they literally had some chords and a title and maybe a melody line but not even lyrics so we would just come up with the parts and they're pretty unusual i mean the beats and arrangements are not all kind of the same. So it was very uh, gratifying to, to work in that context. It was just five guys in a room learning songs. And then we 
cut it immediately with a very good rock producer in Germany named Mac. Yep. And it worked so well, we did it as, as the same exact thing for the second album we did with, with them. So um, in between, so like around the, this time in between, you're doing, you know, s gleaming spires and, uh, you know, you're, you're putting out your own stuff, which is kind of similar, like I said, uh, but I was also listening to some of the music from Bates Motel and this, that's in the bonus tracks of yeah. the first Gleaming Spires album uh, that you have here, um, Songs of the Spires. And I love the songs here. I was listening to the bonus tracks and I was telling Les, uh, boy, these bonus tracks are so good. They should, <laughs> should have come out like the way Marlena moves. Uh, only the young die was like, only the young die young, which is like a really great punk song and a dedication. That's like a potential hit, in my opinion. So I mean, <laughs> he thought so. If you could, if you would like to go back in time and talk to some record executives, yeah, um, <laughs> hopefully who are hopefully dead, uh, <laughs> most likely. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's great uh, the fact that you couldn't because. The fact that did you have difficulties getting promotion at the time because you were part of Sparks and and or because you sounded alike or did basically A and R men and producers and promoters basically say ah this is too close or this is too far ahead of what my audience wants what I'm were their excuses no not, none of the above I mean there were just okay. there were there were a lot of bands in L A and the mystery of who got signed and who didn't you know remains a mystery. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I don't, I mean, you know, I, 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 I we, there's never a question of, of it sounding too much like Sparks or anything like that. It was, it was never, I mean, nobody ever, you know, if somebody doesn't want to sign you, they don't tell you why it could have been, you know, my haircut or lack thereof. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it, it's, you know, it remains a mystery to us when we hear those songs. I mean, especially after all this time, they just sound like a good band as opposed to something I take that personally. <laughs> all right, fair, fair enough. What happened to your lead singer, Bob Hag? Well, Bob was, Bob, Bob and I formed, Bob and I formed Bates Motel a little bit pre-David. Um, Bob and I shared the lead vocals in, in Bates. And um, Bob was in Sparks, and um, Bob is—he's—he's he's done some recording since, and he's—he's he's living in the Antelope Valley and doing very well. Okay, all right, good, good to know. And uh, so uh, another question I had was like coming out with some of these songs. I think the second album, Walk on Lighted Streets, you got better songs in the uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. It, it's a uh, a, a, even though it's got a more of a new wave feel and uh, also it, it sort of goes in it sort of goes along a timeline where I think with Sparks as well where you have Womp That Sucker which has some power pop in it and some new wave but once you get to Angst in My Pants it's full-blown new wave music and Outer Space it's full-blown music and after you guys have left the band after you had left Sparks uh, they're following album or pulling rabbits out of a hat. I, I mean, I think there was nothing that resonated as well as Cool Places or as some of the other songs that were on that previous album. And uh, that leads me to think, oh my God, why did you guys leave Sparks? Or did Russell and, and Ron just say, nah, we want to take a change and just go with some other guys? What happened? If you follow their career, they have really never done the same thing more than two albums in a row. It's just kind of part of their nature, it seems like. Um, yeah, we were an excellent rock group and live Sparks at that time was a really powerful rock band. Um, you know, and partially due to the three of us playing, but I mean, the songs were great of that time. But as I said, they keep making left turns, right turns, you know, and they never stay in the same place. I mean, that's what makes them so brilliant through the years. But I think that's also what makes everyone have favorite periods and not so favorite periods. I mean, they don't make the same record. Yeah. I mean, I would say my, my favorite period is their last three albums. You know, I, I like them even better than I like the ones we played on. So I, I you know, hats off. No, that's good. That's good. And um, tell me a little bit about, um, there were some songs that just 
really stood out to me. I told you dedication was one. On the second album, I think uh, uh, Big Surprise, Fun Type uh, uh, was really good on that second album. And I think Does Your Mother Know is like another potential great hit. People have <laughs> to hear this stuff. Um, you know, I'm going to try and see if I could get my uh, my radio friends to play some of these songs on their on their uh, airwaves and stuff. And also, I liked Christine and uh, Brain Button, which was a lot of fun too. I mean, they are period sounding, They're, you know, because of the drums. David, what's your opinion of the way drumming changed in the '80s, particularly in the new wave movement, when, when you know synthesizers ruled everything and the drum machine kind of ruled over the drummers and yeah yeah tell me your opinions on that and how that changed over the years and 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 how your thoughts on that what changed. are your opinions on the drum machine david <laughs> <laughs> primitive drum machines are fine because they're really not trying to duplicate a person playing it's obviously a different thing the the invention of the lind drum machine made everyone think they could play drums by just going boom whack boom boom whack and frankly, not everyone is a drummer. So I, I, you know, battled with that a lot. I mean, I think the energy of a band, if you want to sound like a band, you need to have a band. That's kind of, uh, if you want going for some other kind of group of sounds, then fine. But to duplicate musicians, you should just have musicians, I think. But yeah, it became, you know, there were some sort of gratuitous, you know, boom, sounds in the 80s that kind of took over the airwaves and Spires, you know, and Sparks Live at that time were real drums and real instruments, but with synthesizers added to real players. And that was always the way for me. So um, as far as drumming and less as far as bass play, um, playing, bl playing guitar, tell me who are your biggest, prior to Sparks and, and all this, who are your biggest influences? Wow. Well, I'm exactly the age to, you know, as trite as it is to have, to have, you know, I was, I was 12 when I want to hold your hand came out and I was starting my first year of college when they broke up. So I can't deny, although I haven't listened to a Beatle album on purpose in 30 years, I, I you know, I, I can't deny it. Um, from that first run of bands, the Kinks would be my band. Um, I was a folky before that, so I have all sorts of closeted folk and country issues that that David's helped me deal with over the years. Um, all right. In uh, the next realm, I you know I mean it was kind of all Bowie, and that was kind of all you could do in the seventies. So, uh, David, your turn. The ABBA, of course. Wow, well, can I forget? Yeah. And they're still going, Abba. So they're, yeah, back in some weird new format. No, I was a big Anglophile too. I mean, the Kinks, the Move, the Who, Cream, Psychedelia. Uh, that was my thing. And then later on, yeah, Bowie and more and Roxy music and you know, Sparks. I mean, we had, although they're a little older than us, but we had similar influences and taste. I think that has more to do with any kind of sound similarity than, than, than okay. anything. All right, yeah. one, on, the, on your last album that came out, uh, Welcoming a New Ice Age, there's a song that just grabbed me. Um, actually, the last song on the album, Harm, <laughs> sounds like a lot like a Devo song with little Prince guitar thrown in uh, at spots. And I mean, it almost sounds like a jumping off point, um, you know, at that point, because I think two years later, you were with, Devo. Jumping off a very high cliff. Is that what you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, And um, basically, um, on, I, th I think for me, listening to, to that and also seeing, out, you know, listening to some of the knowing Devo and being a fan of a lot of their stuff, um, for me, unfortunately, I think, and also critically, they kind of jumped off the cliff too because uh, they never kind of attained their popularity at that point, I'm thinking, geez, David joined the right band at the wrong time, but maybe, and that's maybe what what happened there. But tell me a little bit, a short uh, short version of like what happened when you joined uh, Devo with, with uh, Mark Mothersbaugh, and then I, I think you worked at Mutato Studios, I think it was. Yes. Well, briefly, uh, Devo took a, a hiatus. Actually, um, 
Alan Myers was not a fan of the drum machine either and had kind of all computer music. When they broke up they, or took a break in 84, um, I was doing a lot of other projects, ended up recording with uh, Bob Casale a lot and playing with uh, Bob One in a group called Visiting Kids. So when they started up again, I was kind of a natural person to ask. But again, at that point, they were playing we were, it was five guys in a room playing again instead of all on computer, which made me want to do it again. Um, so on a career arc, if it wasn't their highest point, it was back to what I originally loved about them, just physical playing, you know, and, and good songs, not a big show. Great. Let me ask about, um, I was getting to that other song. I had mentioned Harm, but another <laughs> song that really stood out at me was the Here Comes Mr. Fun Hog. I'm wondering where that came from. It's almost sounds like, you know what? This could have been a cartoon theme. <laughs> it kind of was. Yeah. It, that was actually written for a, a, a film, a teen comedy that we were actually in. And we were kind of a band just playing at a, at a college dance. And we kind of wrote a song specifically for that film. So what that was film was that? Spires would have done. On I, a, I think it was, a, you know, it was like a, a sort of like, cheesy version of Animal House and a fun hog must have been some frat thing that's now now an offensive term. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a, it was, it was I, 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 we, I, we, we, we had a habit with those kind of songs for hire of subverting them as hard as we could. So, you know, the, the rest of the lyrics are not frat boy lyrics. <laughs> Got it. Is there anything that you want to tell me about the, the new uh, Gleaming Spires albums that somebody who isn't familiar with them should should know. Well, we uh, we were masters of jaunty, light sounding music and dark and depressing lyrics, and the combination I think works quite well. We're happy that all of these that so many film, film songs and other tracks that were not released are now uh, in the world again, so. Uh, and and I, I'd say also because the, the remastering of them and, and all, you know, so we, we were working from some pretty shabby originals that are just, you know, deteriorated over the years. And the, the, it's, it's so beautifully done. It's like there, there were kind of like, awful versions of the second album that you could find that just sounded dreadful. And, and Steve Haig's production is so amazing that it, it's kind of nice to, it's very nice to have it back to a place where you can hear how good it is. Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of surprises here on the album. I'm, I don't like, I have to be honest, I don't love everything, but there's <laughs> enough stuff here that I really do like, you know, um, despite, you know, and, and I was, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was into new wave back in the eighties as well as metal and a few other on genres as well as power pop. So, it, you know, I like taking it all in and I like finding some of the great uh, melodies and particularly, like I had mentioned, the bonus tracks um, are just amazing in there. Some of them are, like I said, they, they could have been big hits had they gone out at the time. And if, if uh, you, you know, time and place sort of thing. And um, it seems to be like the big hit that you guys are known for, Are You Ready for the Sex Girls? came out um, and played not only in the movie, but I think it was used in strip clubs as a theme music for strippers or something and everything. Is there, is there anything about that song or writing about that song that you remember like, okay, yeah, we're gonna, or was it strictly a movie project? And it was a throw no, 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 it was, it was a headline in a throwaway, you know, newspaper that advertised massages. Uh, you know, alcohol massage. And there was just a headline that said, are you ready for the sex girls? And we like, we thought we could write a song with that title. And um, interestingly, we were in, in, we were recording the second Sparks album in Munich when it became a huge hit on the radio in LA. So we were out of town for our 15 minutes of fame. We like literally, you know, people would call us up going, hey, your song's on the radio. And they'd hold up the phone. And by the time we got back, we would have to like, beg the DJ at K-Rock to play it one more time so we could just hear it on the radio once. Uh, so we, we, we missed our 15 minutes. All right, but you had more than 15 minutes with Sparks and as a, uh, you played live in concert with them as well for quite a while. Anything, tell me about the most unusual experience you had in concert playing live 
Uh, any any strange goings on that occurred that you witnessed? <laughs> or embarrassing the, things? The, 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 the live sex and heroin orgy at Winterland? Is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> <laughs> we that whole period of time since spires had the same four guys besides ron and russell as the group there were funny switches back and forth where literally we would be doing spark shows and two days later switch over to gleaming spires um one one perfect example of that was uh in los angeles here at a very large venue this group called talk talk opened for sparks and then two days later gleaming spires open for talk talk so that that kind of stuff happened um people you know art art is sort of finished when when it's seen or heard through the eyes of somebody else and that was certainly the case with the song are you ready for the sex goals it's far more subversive than it may seem on the face of it but however people absorbed it you know ultimately and and, and I, I honestly say, because, you know, I, I think David and I have both made the mistake, certainly I have, of going for the commercial throat. We had no clue that that, that was going to, that, that, that it was going to be taken that way. Like, and we should have known, because it's like, you know, it's advertising 101. If you say the word sex, it will sell, right? Well, like we knew that, but it just, it was like, we had no ulterior motive in that one whatsoever. It was just it. We thought we were writing a nasty little ditty. A little cultural appropriation, yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I appreciate the interview and uh, we'll get people listening to, uh, you know, some Gleaming Spires now that it's out and about with people. Uh, thanks so much for, for your interview. Thank you. Thank you much, yeah. All right, have a great Bye. time. See ya. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.